How about some mother out there starts off with an uh, opening prayer for Yahuwah's uh, attention on us? Allah, we praise thy name, Abaya. We praise thee and we love thee. We exalt thee, Father, for being our loving Father, our provider, for having us, oh, Father, in your ways. In this day, Mother's Day celebration, right? Uh, who like thee, Father, who like thee, who are father and mother and brethren, protector, creator, redeemer. We praise thee, Father, in this name. And we ask that you would open our ears and our eyes to receive your word. We thank thee for providing us with thy, thy salvation, thy Dalit, Yahusha. In your name, Father, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. There's different calendars regarding the Moedim. And one of the earliest calendars this year for starting Pesach puts this at 50 days out, in which case this would be the day called Shavuot, the day where it's a commanded gathering, as discussed in Leviticus 23, among other places. The subject of today's talk, and this is May 8th, the subject of today's is a passage in Leviticus 24, verses 10 to 16, specifically, we'll talk about a couple other verses, but it has to do with blaspheming the Shem Kadosh of Yahuwah. What does that mean and how do you do it? So the only reason why that's a big deal is because of two passages in the scripture. One is Leviticus 24, and the other one is in Matthew 12, and in verse 31 and 32, this is reading probably King James, Yahusha is speaking. Apparently it's also in Mark 3.28, Luke 12.10, Hebrews 6.4, and 10.26. Matthew 12, 31, wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So there's question as to the legitimate consideration of a thing called the Trinity. And here's one case where, well, Yahushua's speaking, so that's the son, and we know that he references his father, and here he's talking about the Holy Ghost, at least in King James English. So that qualifies or validates this whole idea about a, a Trinity concept, or where does it come from? Well, who's the Holy Ghost? Some people say the Holy Spirit, in Hebrew would be Ruach Ha, Ruach would be spirit, Ha means the, and then the word spelled Kuf Dalit Sheen or Kuf Dalit Vav Sheen, Kadosh, are English letters Q D S H. And I say Q because most people spell the word Kadosh with a K, K A D O S H. The problem is the K is the letter equivalent with the letter Kaf, which is the open hand. The letter Kuf, our English letter Q, is the back of the head. It's the, the letter Q is the rounded top, kind of like this hard hat, with the vertical. So there's the, the circle with the line, the, the, the spelled, I, I always write it Q-O-O-F, Kuf. 
as opposed to the letter K, which is K-A-F, kaf and kuf. And I say that because it's very often corrupted. The, the two letters in, in, you'll never know how to spell in Hebrew if you follow that you might say protocol or that tendency to not care because most people spell phonetically rather than with the transliteration of the of the replacing English letters with the Hebrew letter equivalents. And we've talked about that before, where I'll write the word ayin, it's pronounced as if it was a. Y I N, but I spell it with an O Y I N, not because it's pronounced Oyen, but because it's the equivalent of the letter O. K L M N O P, so you got Kaf Lamed Mem Nun, there's no Samic. I N P O P Q R S T, Kuf Resh Shin Tav. So there's this English compared to the Hebrew. And I'm just saying that because. If you want to learn how to spell, if you want to learn the significance of the spelling in Hebrew, you must make that determination. So anyway, what's or who's the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit? I've heard some people say that the word Shekinah, where you get the word Shekin, where you get the word Mishkan, which means to dwell, tabernacle, mishkan, in Greek, taverno, in English, you get the word then tavern, like the local pub, the watering hole down at the end of the street corner where the neighborhood gets together to shoot pool and drink beer or lemonade or whatever they're going to have. Sweet tea, you just hang around and are refreshed. That's the tavern. The public house, the pub, that's where that name comes from. That's the same as the word Mishkan. And Shekinah, I've heard some people say, is the name of the Holy Spirit, the feminine gendered name, Shekinah. It just means the presence or the dwelling. So how does anybody find out what's really going on? We've talked about the idea of there being some kind of truth in the universe, but yet there's thousands of different denominations and you might say big religions. There's at least Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism. Then you've got all kinds of other isms. How does anybody know what the truth is? I've asked people the question, maybe sitting at a restaurant talking and the waiter walks up and say, well, hey, let me ask you a question. Is there any way to determine truth? And I've heard answers back, there is no truth. Is that true? I heard somebody else once say, truth is whatever you want it to be. Make up your own truth. Is that true? I've asked people, even Christians, ministers, people that maybe had been missionaries, just whatever, did the creator of the universe give humans some mechanism, some tool, like a carpenter working on a job site might use a plumb line, a string with a weight, and because of the way the physics of the universe works, that weight will hold the string tight and you can determine pure accurate verticality. If you take a stick with a curved vial with a bubble in it and with a liquid, they used to put whiskey in it so it wouldn't freeze. It's called a whiskey stick. It'll tell you exactly pure horizontal or vertical if you use it on a different plane, but you can also take a hose and put water in it, and you can stretch that hose out as far as you want if you're doing construction. If you're laying out a foundation 
and you put a clear end of the hose at both ends and you fill it up so that the water is somewhere at both ends in that clear part of the vial. And the way the world is built is that you will have exactly level way over here and way over there when you lift up that hose such that you can see the water and you can level a foundation. Unless it's too big and you're on a curved earth, in which case it'll slope, but maybe that doesn't matter. The point is, what I'm saying is that there's mechanisms, if you know about physics, to determine true verticality and true horizontal. But did the maker of the universe provide humanity with some means to identify, designate, or determine just truth. You might say as an ideological given. And I've heard people say, no, he didn't. Faith is whatever you choose to believe. Well, that doesn't make it true. You can believe anything, hence all the different religions. Which one of them is true? Is any of them true? Does anybody know for certain what's true? The significance of the Torah is that the speaker giving words, especially, not only limited to, but especially his voice on Mount Sinai, and then his very own finger writing in tables of stone, the Ten Commandments, the uh, Deborim, is a revelation and expression of absolute pure truth. Anybody who doesn't have access to those words has a, you might say, a generation off or another generation off, however many translations or permutations of that truth. Some people don't even believe that the Mount Sinai event ever happened. I was talking to someone, there was a book, I believe it was called Exodus Gold, Jim Cornicky, I think, based on Ron Wyatt's discovery that there's chariot wheels, coral encrusted in the Red Sea. And across from this one wadi on the, on the Sinai Peninsula side of the Red Sea, there was a, some kind of a obelisk that apparently King Solomon installed, heralding this as the location of the crossing of the Exodus, crossing the Sea of Reeds, Yom Suf, and that Mount Sinai then is a place that we is now referred to as Jabal al Laz, uh, Arabic word, in Saudi Arabia. And that there's pictures of carvings on rocks that somebody a long time ago did, which people have determined were what the Israelites carved on the rocks, including pictures of oxen or cows, which they weren't supposed to do, making pictures and the golden calf statue idol to somehow worship with put Yahweh's name on it. And it's like, what the, the top of this mountain is burned black. And there's a cave up there that they suggest is the cave that Elijah went to and uh, was in, that Moshe was in when Yahuwah passed by and put his hand on it and declared his name. But the beginning of this book said that the biggest synagogue in Los Angeles, and Los Angeles has one of the biggest populations of people who identify as Jews for one reason or another. There's like half a dozen different classifications of what a Jew is. But anyway, as a people group, one of the biggest concentrations of Jews in the world is in Los Angeles. And the biggest synagogue there, according to, a, you might say, the intro to this book said, they do not believe that the Exodus happened as the biblical narrative tells us it did. 
That's astounding to me. That's preposterous. It's like, why do you call yourself this people group if you don't believe the story? Well, it's a myth, I suppose, at least some people believe, it's just only a myth that provides cultural cohesion so that the people of that persuasion can have some interesting stories like fairy tales or whatever it might be to identify with. And whether or not the exodus happened, whether or not the Red Sea crossing happened, whether or not Pharaoh's army was drowned in the Yom Suf and that the Israelites crossed over on dry land doesn't matter because these days the people just are who they are and you believe whatever you want to believe. Well, to me, all that's bogus. All that's nothingness. All that means that uh, there's no point in having a further conversation with any of those people unless they want to discuss the legitimacy of getting on board with the actual, very real, exact believing of these words. So, to me, my understanding is that the absolute truth of the whole universe can be found in these 22 letters as written on this hat, Aleph through Tav. And that there's something about this menorah. There's something about having the, the menorah, which is a statement of truth, of reality. And these things were designed by the creator of the universe for human consciousness to appreciate, to apprehend. He caused them fit to the mind of human beings that he also invented. Therefore, this subject that we're talking about, about saying to believe there's a very specific individual creator who did communicate with his creation and that human beings are not just another form of animal life, but they are a set apart life form. Because he said so in Genesis 1. That he made humans to speak with a mind hand, eye, mouth tied together in the brain, all dealing with language. And so you get a guy like Stan Tenen with Miru, M-E-R-U, uh, believing that the original language was gesture, hand language. And then you have the written orthography of the letters and the phonetic consonants that go to different places in the brain and the mind where you can see things that are spoken that this was all by intentional design of the creator and that the purest, absolute purest form of communication is in the Ivrit, the Hebrew language, and that the creator himself invented the Hebrew alphabet group of letters. It was not not a human invention. That Adam, was equipped somehow with these letters as a set by which he could do this first job, which was naming all the animals. Question is, did Adam have a written alphabet, what you call orthography? That's not a Hebrew word, but that would be a blend of probably English and Greek, graphic graphene, grammar, that's a Greek word meaning something drawn or written, scripted. Ortho is where we get like orthopedic, which is the shape, the correct shape. So orthography is somebody determining the correct shape of the letters. So you can have different alphabet sets, what we would call fonts, but they're all based on a basic concept of what the letters are. I would say that that was probably determined by Yahuwah, but there's no evidence of that. There's stories in the book of Jasher, in the book of Jubilees, and the book of Enoch. Those aren't Torah. 
when we get to the Torah and we find the first mention of the word to write, which is katub, kaf, tav, bet, it's seven chapters before Elohim wrote with his finger on the tables of stone. It says Moshe wrote all the words of Yahuwah. If the words of Yahuwah take essence by this by the way they're spelled with the Hebrew letters, then you cannot use English or Greek or cuneiform or Egyptian hieroglyphics to write all the words of Yahuwah. You'd have to write them with the Hebrew letters. So Moshe in Exodus 17, no, it'd be uh, seven chapters before, what would be uh, Exodus 12, I could look it up, but the point is seven chapters before Exodus 20 where Yahweh wrote with his finger. Well, that's not true either. I think it is 17, he wrote with his finger on, in Exodus 31. Anyway, uh, sorry, I don't have the numbers uh, correctly in my mind, but the point is Moshe was told to write all the words of Yahuwah Seven chapters later, Yahweh wrote with his finger on the tables of stone, which was a number of chapters after he spoke on Mount Sinai. Why am I going on about this? Well, today, by one calendar reckoning, is Shavuot. Apparently, that was the day that Yahuwah spoke from Mount Sinai, according to a certain reckoning of the calendar. It's supposed to be counting 50 days. So some, some people call this Pentecost, which is Greek. Penta means 50, cost, like what does something cost if you're going to buy it, means to count. So counting 50 is where you come up with the word Pentecost. And when I was a young person going to church, I always had heard, oh, this is the birthday of the church, Pentecost. Sometimes it was made mention of, sometimes it was ignored. But really never too much of a big deal was made about it. I mean, why, why should we? Okay, what's this about? So if you look in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, if you go to Leviticus 24, there's this thing called a parasha in the Jewish Bible. A parasha is spelled pereshin tov, parashat. If you read it in English, it says parashas. That's because there's two different or three different ways to pronounce the letter tov, either as a T, an S, or a TH. So, and I'm just telling you this to so you know what, how you understand the language. You, if you will have the house of truth, I would say, or I would read it, bet a met. But other people might say, bes emes. If you have the word Shabbat, shin bet tov, other people call it shavas, as if it was a v, s h v s, shavas. Why is that? The Tav can be pronounced like Beth, Beth Lehem, that would be Bet Lehem. So there the Tav is pronounced as a T-H. Just so you know what's going on. Anyway, so you get to Leviticus 24, and it's right in the middle of a parasha. What a parasha is, is not exactly a chapter, but it's like a chapter. It's where something is cut into other segments. The chapter 24, the chapters that are in the English Bible weren't put in until I believe it was the Middle Ages somewhere, chapter and verse. At the end of chapter 24, as you go to chapter 25, it says, Parashah Bahar, bet Hey resh Well, then Chapter 24 is part of what starts in chapter 21, which is called Parasha E-M-O-R, E-M-O-R. You can say, well, where do they come up with that word? If you look at the first word of the first verse in Leviticus 21, it says, Vayamer, 
Yahuwah el Moshe. So speaking Yahweh unto Moshe. So this word that they spell in English, E-M-O-R, is their pronunciation with English letters, transliteration of the word Yod Aleph Mem Resh, Yamor, which means to speak or declare. So this parasha, which covers chapters 21 to 24, is all a single unit of thought of Yahuwah declaring some matter. I mean, there's many chapters where it says Yahweh's Vayamer Yahweh al Moshe, but this parasha in particular, so we can say in order to get a handle, an understanding of what's going on in chapter 24, we really should see what's happening in this whole parasha. So if you look at chapter 21, Uh, verse 6, in English it says, they, talking about the priests now, the sons of Aaron, say to the Kohanim, the priests, the sons of Aaron. This is going back up to verse 1. Tell them, each of you shall not contaminate himself to a dead person. Then he goes on to verse 6. They shall be kadosh to their Elohim and shall not desecrate the Shem of their Elohim. For the fire offering of Yahuwah, the food of their Elohim they offer, so they must remain Kadosh. Okay, that's what's going on in this parasha. Saying to the priests, they absolutely must not desecrate the Shem of their Elohim known as yod heh vav -He. Verse 9 says, if the daughter of a Kohen, a priest, will be desecrated through adultery, she desecrates her father, she shall be consumed by the fire, burned at the stake? Or is that to be when she dies, she's cremated? That's a pretty uh, tough sentence here. But this is all about not desecrating the name for a priest to not desecrate the name of Yahweh. If you get into chapter 22, verse 2, speak to Aharon and his sons that they shall withdraw from the holies of the children of Israel, that which they sanctify to me, so as to not desecrate my Kadosh name, Ani Yahweh, I am Yahuwah. This is talking about eating of that which has been set aside for the priest, in that I uh, get down to verse 16, chapter 22 of Leviticus, they, uh, verse 15, they shall not desecrate the holies of the children of Israel, or the kadosh things, the set-apart things, which are only for the priests, which they set aside to Yahweh, they will cause themselves to bear the sin of guilt when they eat their holies, for I am Yahweh who sanctifies them. This phrase, eat their holies, means that there are certain things which are set apart. Now, this is Yahuwah telling his people that the office of a priest is special, is different than the normal person, telling them who they can marry, telling them what they eat, what they can touch, not touch. If you go down to verse 25, Leviticus 22, from the hand of a stranger you may not offer the food of your Elohim from any of these, for their corruption is in them, a blemish is in them, they will not find favor for you. He's talking about a fire offering saying, you can't use a blemished animal. You have to take a male of the best of the flock, the best of the herd. Why? Is it just a ritual? Is it just a ceremonial behavior? Well, Yahoo says, if you do it wrong, they will not find favor for you, as if to say, 
if you do things correctly, you'll find favor with Elohim. It's like, how does that work? There's another verse. Gosh, I forget where it is. It might be in Psalms. But it talks about people singing and fasting. Maybe it's in Isaiah 58. Anyway, the point is, yeah, it's Isaiah 58. Why do we fast and you don't see and you don't hear our prayers? And People do those things in order to find favor. And Yahuwah speaks as if he's saying, you do a certain dance and I'll recognize it. You do a certain behavior and I'll say, hey, and then I will pay attention to you and give you my attention of favor. The, the uh, I'm trying to find the word for blemish or favor. The word for favor is, uh, I believe, is Yod Resh Zadi, which is to run. And uh, some words it's hard to read and in, in because the way they're translated. This is, they will not find favor for you. And the word is uh, because mem shin het tav mem. Well, that's mashach. That's, that's Mashiach. In them, mem vav mem, bet mem, lo yod resh zadi vav, So the uh, that word Mashiach kind of sounds like it, or Mashiach, a derivative of Mashiach must be the word that has the word blemish. Interesting. Anyway, uh, we'll have to look at that some other time. My point is, the New Testament concept is all Elohim's disfavor was poured out onto Yahusha at the time of the crucifixion, and all of our favor that we get is because we are found in him or believe in him or are under his blood, and that there's nothing we can do to get Elohim's favor other than just believe in the death of the Mashiach. What is true? Is it true that if we do what Yahuwah says, we can find favor? Did he change the rules at the time the Old Testament became New Testament? In which case you can say, well, what event changed Old Testament reality, Old Testament truth, into what we would call a New Testament reality, a New Testament truth. At what point did he say, to find my favor, you need to do what I say? And then all of a sudden he changed the rules and said, from now on, you don't have to do what I say. All you have to do is believe that Jesus did what I said. And so if you claim his name, then you get my favor. Well, was that Christmas Day when Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem? There's some talk that he had to learn, that he had to walk out without sinning his life. So was that the grand event when he was born? Maybe when he was conceived in the Virgin Mary's womb. But at the baptism, at, at the time of John the Baptist in the Jordan River, there was a voice from heaven that said, this day I have begotten you. This day I have begotten you. I thought be begotten was before the foundation of the world. So 
What do you make of that? Does that mean at the time of the baptism, something changed that before that he wasn't the son of God? But yet, up until the time of the crucifixion, wasn't everything still Old Testament? The, all the, uh, he was still observing the Moedim in the Sabbath day. That was his custom. In fact, he was taken off the cross when he was already dead, but because it says the Passover was drawing nigh, or the, at least the first day of unleavened bread, the 15th day of the first month. So he was still observing Passover. That didn't change. In fact, the reason why the disciples in the New Testament book of Acts were meeting in the upper room on the 50th day is because it was Shavuot. It wasn't the birthday of the church. It was them observing the commandment in Leviticus 23. So they were still under some what we might call Old Testament legality, according to the disciples. Is that when the Holy Spirit was poured out onto the church? The day of Pentecost, the second chapter of Acts? Or did he already exist and already was, who is this Holy Spirit? Did Old Testament become New Testament at the crucifixion? Well, you got a dead man laying, you know, buried in the earth. Is anything different? Maybe it was at the resurrection. Is that when Old Testament became New Testament? At what point did Elohim determine we no longer have to pay attention to anything he said? 50 days after the crucifixion, the disciples were observing the instructions of Yahuwah's Torah by meeting on the day of Shavuot. Nobody apparently informed them that the rules were done away with. So how do we know whether we've inherited the truth or distortions of lies or mistakes 2,000 years later with all these different what we might call New Testament or church age considerations. You get to uh, the last uh, couple verses of chapter 22 of Leviticus, and it says, verse 32, you shall not desecrate my Kadosh Shem. Shem Kadoshi, so it says in Hebrew, rather, I should be sanctified among the children of Israel. Now, that's all Israel. That's not just the Kohanim, the priests. I am Yahuwah who sanctifies you. And then verse 33, who took you out of the land of Egypt, be Elohim unto you, Ani Yahuwah. I am Yahuwah. I am Yahuwah who sanctifies you. Do not desecrate my Shem Kadosh. And that word desecrate is spelled Het Lamed Lamed. Now, the interesting thing, that if you look up that word Het Lamed Lamed, Halal, a similar word to Hey Lamed Lamed, which is where you get the word Hallelujah, Het Lamed Lamed is a real similar word with Arabic or Islamic halal food, what does that mean? It's not the same word, but halal, halal, is a, is a way of, it's almost like the word kosher in, in uh, Jewish thinking, Arabic halal food, but in this case, it's het lamed lamed. You look it up in the Red Dictionary, Klein's Etymological Dictionary, and it says it means to be profane or common. It means like using a dirty mouth, as some might say. It, it's also to punch holes in, empty something out, and make it hollow. So it's also the word for flute. So flute is this tube with holes punched in it, and you blow air in it, and you play notes. That's a het lamed lamed. 
It's also an astronaut because an astronaut goes up to outer space in a hollow tin can spaceship and he's up in the vacuum of space, same word. But that word also means to pierce and perforate, punch holes in. It means to start something new. And it means a priest of questionable legitimate descent, like we don't know who his father is, or we think he had some uh, funny business going on in his generations, and so we're not going to consider him to be of pure lineage of Kohenim. And it also means that a priest denied the priesthood. Well, the interesting thing about this word, het lamed lamed, is it's kind of the story of Jesus Christ. He was, as the Christian regard is, our high priest. But yet to the Jews, he's denied the priesthood. He's denied the consideration. Why? Because he was of, of questionable descent. In other words, who was his father? Well, if it was born of the Virgin Mary, he didn't have a father. His father was God. Is that true? People don't believe it. Questionable descent. So they pierced and perforated him, punched holes in him, and drained out his blood and started a new religion. And they considered him profane, vile, desecrated him and his reputation by hanging him between two thieves. So the definition of this word, het lamed lamed, I noticed was exactly the story of Jesus Christ. And yet here it says, lo tachalalo et shem kadoshi. Do not do all that stuff that's het lamed lamed, aleph tav shem kadoshi. So when I bumped into this a number of years ago, it's, it's, it's a kick in the head. It's like running into a brick wall. You have to stop and say, what have we done? What are we doing? What's going on? If Yahuwah, the Elohim of Israel said, I am Yahuwah, I make you Kadosh. I sanctify you. And you need to make my Shem Kadosh in the midst, Batok here, B'nai Israel, in the midst of Israel, you shall exalt my Shem, my name. What's his Shem? What's his name? Well, the JWs, Jehovah's Witnesses, think they're doing that by saying Jehovah. Only that's not how you pronounce his name, so they're not making that very sanctified. But then have they spun off with different doctrines? I, I, I don't know. What does he want us to do? I have taken you out of the land of Egypt to be Elohim to you. I am Yahuwah. Well, then if we want to be that people, shouldn't we be recognizing the Exodus event? And shouldn't be, we be recognizing his name and what it means for him to be our Elohim? Are we doing that when we take this one represented by everything that the word het lamed lamed profane, defiled, desecrated means, and say, he's our God. Isn't that a desecration? Regardless of who he really is, regardless of why he allowed himself to be desecrated, or came down here and did the desecration himself, he says, I myself have succumbed to death. Nobody takes my life from me. Why did he have to die? We talked about that. Uh, what I'm saying is that this stirs up a great consternation and confusion. And yet people say, God is not the author of confusion. He certainly is. He's the guy that authored all this. Then we get to verse, or chapter 23, verse 1. Yahuwah spoke to Moshe saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, Yahweh's appointed festivals that you are to designate as Kadosh convocations. 
These are my appointed festivals. So I was talking to a friend, I mentioned this the other day, I read that verse and they were saying, wait a minute, we're not the children of Israel, we're Americans, we're Christians. Well then, don't bother to read any further. The question is, who are you? Who is he? Yahuwah spoke to Moshe saying, speak to the children of Israel. Well, if you don't associate, identify with this people group, then don't waste the rest of your time. But if you do, then this is all about his identity because the word for Moedim, appointed festivals, Moedi, literally means testimony and witness. So he gave us chapter 23, where it talks about Pesach and unleavened bread and counting the Omer in verse 9. And then it says in verse 15, you will count for yourselves from the morrow of the rest day, from the day when you bring the Omer of the waving seven weeks they shall be complete until the morning of the seventh week shall you count 50 days and you shall offer a new meal offering to yahuwah okay then he talks about from your dwelling places you shall bring bread shall be waved two loaves made of a two tentifa they shall be fine flour they shall be baked leaven fires first offerings to yahweh with the bread you shall offer seven unblemished lambs in their first year, one young bull, two rams, they shall be burnt offering to Yahweh with their meal offering and libations, a, a fire offering, a satisfying rope. Now, does that mean that everybody, every household is supposed to bring these? Two loaves with seven unblemished lambs, a young bull, a two rams? Or that was for the whole nation. So it doesn't mean that each one of us on this day or however you reckon the calendar forthcoming, that you should offer up two loaves. What are we supposed to do? So somebody was asking, how are we supposed to do this? Verse 20, the Kohen shall wave them. The Kohen, the priest, upon the first offering, breads as a wave service before Yahweh. Upon the two sheep. Then on verse 21, you shall convoke or meet together on this very day. There shall be a kadosh convocation, holy convocation for yourselves. You shall do no laborious work. Well, that's something we can do. It's an eternal decree in your dwelling places for your generations. Okay. So how much of this can we do? If we're trying to be his people and walk in his ways, I'm not going to bring a seven sheep and a bull and two rams, nor should I necessarily bring two loaves. I could bring two loaves, and the word there is challah, challah bread. Challah bread typically is braided, and it's a certain type of flour. And if you look at the word challah, het lamed hay, which is the derivatives of het lamed lamed, it means to be sweet and pleasant, and it also means to be sick and rusty. So here again in Hebrew, it's one thing and the other, like two sides of the menorah. It's sweet and pleasant, it's ill, sick, deteriorated, rusty. Het vav lamed, cool, which is another derivative, is as we said before the word hula it means to dance it means sand it's the word for the phoenix which is the bird that resurrects out of its own death in the ashes it also means to writhe in travail like doing a type of dance and another derivative word is het yod lamed heil where you get like heil hitler like they used to say in the in Germany back in the 1940s. It, it's the word for military. Ashat Chayil is a valiant woman or like a military woman talked about in Proverbs 31. So what is this word Het Lamed or Het Lamed Lamed? 
This parasha, Leviticus 21 and 22, he says his name needs to be regarded as sacred by the people of Israel. And the way to do that, he gives us in 23, is to keep the seven Moedim. But he starts off with Yom HaShavat. Chapter 23, verse 3, for six days labor may be done, the seventh day of the day of complete rest, a holy convocation. You should not do any work. It's a Sabbath for Yahweh and all your dwelling places. And then in verse 4, these are the appointed festivals of Yahweh, the holy convocations with which you shall designate the appropriate time in the first month and the 14th month in the afternoon is the time of the Pesach offering to Yahweh. Okay, so he starts off saying seven Moedim, but it starts with the Sabbath day. So it's my understanding that the way the Torah is laid out is that it's not necessarily always in chronological order of events, but it is a very specific order of flow of thought. So sometimes you'll see a historical event out of place in terms of when did it happen on the calendar. But the way it's read in order through the text of the Torah is on purpose. So for him to start off with, this is what the Kohen should do. Do not desecrate the name of Elohim and only marry a certain, uh, it says a widow, a divorcee, a desecrated woman, a harlot, he shall not marry these. Only a virgin is virgin of his people, he shall take his wife. That's verse 14 of chapter 21. And then he describes physical blemishes. You can't be a priest. And then in chapter 22, like we said, here is talking about eating or offering blemished animals. Then chapter 23, he says, okay, this is what you need to do in order to keep my Shem Kadosh. And so we've talked about saying, let's not suggest we put labels on anybody. I'm not going to say, you're going to burn in hell, and you're not really a, a sacred person or a kadosh or holy, or you know, you've got the wrong God or whatever that might be. But I wonder why the church at large, at large, meaning of all the thousands of denominations, why have they for 2,000 years, why have we for 2,000 years forsaken this chapter of Leviticus 23? It's just a matter of observation. Do we observe the seventh day? No. Do we observe the 14th day of the first month, the 15th day? No. Do we count to 50? No. We don't do any of those things, nor do we talk about them or teach them, but yet Yahuwah, the Elohim of Israel, said these are his testimonies. They testify of his identity. They are his moedi, which means choice, best, treasure. Mem, I involve Dalit Yod. I and Dalit Yod, Memvav, I and Dalit Yod, I and Dalit Yod, choice, best, treasure, adornment, ornamentation, bejewelment. Yahuwah bejeweled himself with these moedim, and the, let's just say the seven churches, the thousands of denominations have all bailed, abandoned the things that identify Yahweh. Now, if there was going to be a standard of truth, I would expect these to be it, these Moedim. So if we don't have that standard of truth, you have no plumb line. You have no whiskey stick. You have no reality. You have no bearing on what's what. Verse 31 of Leviticus 23, just a random verse 30. And any soul he'll, who will do any work on this very day, I will destroy that soul from among its people. This is the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. 
You shall not do any work. It is an eternal decree throughout your generations in all your dwelling places. What part of that was done away with when Jesus was baptized? Or even rose from the dead? Or even was conceived in the womb of his mother? Then we get to chapter 24. 